colleagues, friends, and dear students, welcome to the fifth of our uh, webinar sessions organized by Atlas University, Departments of English Language and Literature and Translation and Interpreting Studies. Today, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce a colleague, a friend and a classmate, Professor Huriye Reis of Hacettepe University. Welcome to our uh, session, Professor Reyes. Thank you for uh, accepting our invitation. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a great pleasure on my part. Thank you. Now I will introduce Professor Ray's academic uh, background. She studied English language and literature at Hacettepe University, and she also received her MA from the same university with a thesis on Chaucer's narrator in his dream poems. And uh, after this MA, a degree, she went to England and uh, received her PhD from the University of Liverpool uh, with a thesis on Chaucer's representations of women in his dream poetry. She has publications on Chaucer, medieval English literature, contemporary British poetry, war poetry, and representations of women in medieval literature. She is the author of a book titled Adem'in Bilmediği, Havanın Gördediği, Orta Çağda Türk ve İngiliz Kadın Yazarlar. In English, What Adam Knows Not and Eve Demands, English and Turkish Women Writers of the Middle Ages. This book was published by uh, Dirt by Yayinevi, Ankara, in 2005. Uh, her other book is titled Chaucer and the Representation of Old Age. This book was published by Ürün Publishing House in Ankara in 2013. Professor Reyes is the co-editor of a book titled Gender in British Literature, published in 2017. And she is the co-editor of another book published uh, in 2021 by Nobel Publishing House in Ankara. And the title of the book is 16 States of Loneliness in Literature and Culture. Edebiyat ve Kültürde Yalnızlığın 16 Hali. Professor Reis works as a full-time professor at Hacettepe University and teaches various undergraduate and postgraduate courses in medieval literature, contemporary poetry, literary criticism, British cultural studies, and gender studies. Today, she will talk about uh, Chaucer's uh, poems, and her title is Looking at Chaucer's World Through His Poems. The floor is yours, Professor. Thank you very much, Gülşen uh, Hocam. Um, I think I'm going to start with an apology in the first place that my title will not be exactly Chaucer's poems but mainly one particular poem. But before I start my talk, I'd like to just remind you that I'm getting messages about this uh, meeting code and meeting number, and that some people are not able to join. And then, yeah, they say that's okay. I hope uh, that they will uh, be able to join us. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. I guess my title is Looking at Chaucer's World Through His Poems. And I aim to here uh, today to talk about particularly the major events of the 14th century to some extent that seem to have an impact on what I characterize as the work of change, the Canterbury Tales itself as a work of change that identifies the change and that illustrates the change and uses that change as both poetic material and also as a way of commenting on that particular change in society. So I will be using some slides which I'd like to share with you. Uh, and then afterwards, I will uh, talk about particularly the pilgrimage itself as an element of change that frames the Canterbury Tales on the one hand, and also 
is itself an event, a regular event in the Middle Ages uh, based on the idea of the change. Um, and then I will talk about uh, a little bit about the particular position of the um, Canterbury Tales as a work that seems to be situated in a kind of a hybrid way between the literacy or the um, written culture and the oral culture. And we'll make references in that sense to some of the um, particular um, quotes uh, from the Canterbury Tales. And I might be referring as well to the dream poems of Chaucer in this regard, because uh, it is in fact in the dream poems that we have a particular mention and a kind of an inscription of the culture of the Middle Ages as a um, written culture, as a bookish and book culture that the narrator in the dream poems particularly focuses on. And finally, um, I'd like to talk about uh, the wife of Bath and her prologue particularly. And I will use two main statements that she makes in her prologue uh, about and use these uh, codes all, as well to actually identify her as a figure of change that brings about the change that we actually identify with the Canterbury Tales. So if you allow me to uh, share screen I'd like to share screen and that hopefully will go okay. Um, you help able to see my um, screen? Yes, Ajahn. Yes. But there seems to be something wrong with it though, with my screen. Just a moment. Oh yes, here. Okay, then maybe this way it will be better. Um, right. This is my title, as you already know, and then I actually include uh, a manuscript illustration of Chaucer. Chaucer wrote in an age of manuscripts. In fact, he has a poem that actually refers to this particular practice of um, manuscript production, his scribe. He seems to have had his own scribe who's named as Adam in his very short poem to Adam, his, his own scrivener. And that there he seems to also identify some problems with the manuscript production, particularly um, uh, in the production of an um, sort of um, communal culture and communal literature. Uh, and the dependence on the scribes for that is highlighted in this poem. That Chaucer seems to somehow chide and then tell off um this scribe for miswriting his his works and uh, warns him of uh, the future possible potential mistakes um, here we have a, as i said a manuscript illustration of chaucer reading in fact to one chaucer is a 14th century poet for those who probably are not so very familiar with him he is believed to have been born around 40, 1340s uh, according to some 43 and then died at the end of the um, 14th century in the year 1400 and uh, he is the one who actually established the Poets Corner by dying in 1400 and being buried at the Westminster Abbey there. But there is a significant thing about Chaucer in that he was not actually recognized as a poet in his own time, it seems, apart from the manuscripts uh, that circulated. And that uh, the reason why he was buried at this um, um, I'm going to use this style because the, the, the picture is not so really clear. Um, the reason why he was buried at Westminster Abbey and started the Poets Corner there uh, was because he was closely associated with the Abbey itself as the clerk of the King's works. So here are a number of pictures to show you around because um, this Westminster Abbey and the Poets Corner is a place where now we have quite a lot of the poets that followed after Chaucer to be inscribed there and to be represented, including the floor and the and the and the walls as well. And here you have the um, kind of um, the box where uh, Chaucer seems to be buried under. 
And again, the links are there about Chaucer and his uh, presentation there. Chaucer was recognized, especially by his followers, as the father of English poetry. And the reason why he was so uh, recognized was particularly because he wrote in the language uh, that's English, as opposed to French and also Latin, that were the three languages used by his contemporary, for example, John Gower. And uh, by the 15th century poets who not only hailed him as the father of English poetry, uh, and his particular use of language, but also hailed him as, um, at, and uh, imitated him, in fact, right? They tried to actually continue some of his works uh, as part of this literary tradition, um, also dubbed him as so. Okay. Um, the pilgrimage that I'm going to talk about and gives occasion to the Canterbury Tales is actually a historical pilgrimage, as I'll be telling you so. But um, it starts at the Tabard Inn, um, which is an actual historical um, hostel or uh, what you can call a cavern where the pilgrims would stay for before they set off on their way to Canterbury. And um, Chaucer uh, seems to have uh, located these pilgrims here, and the speaker or the narrator of the Canterbury Tales also seems to be actually a figure of, of that particular pilgrimage. And here are a number of pictures of this um, tabard in these are drawings or engravings, and this unfortunately does not survive anymore. Uh, it, is, it was uh, demolished in the late, it seems, um, 19th century, and afterwards, um, it was rebuilt uh, and then continued for a little more while, but then it was totally uh, demolished. Now, today, as far as I know, there is a particular mark uh, marking the place of this uh, Tabard Inn. Uh, this place seems to be quite a place with uh, its old inns at, at, at this part of um, London. And then uh, the pilgrimage starts at Tabard Inn and then it aims to go to Canterbury, the Canterbury Cathedral, because uh, it aims to visit the um, shrine of Thomas a. Beckett there, which again no longer survives because it, they went with the dissolution of the monasteries. Uh, it seems that Henry VIII actually also dissolved this. And that symbolically, until recently, as far as I know, there was a candle burning at the very spot of that shrine. And now it is being reconstructed and so is available. And so the, the journey that starts in London then goes, uh, follows the route to Canterbury and to the shrine of Thomas Beckett there. Uh, here is a, a route that is actually um, starting from Southwark and then going through these uh, places. These places are not uh, uh, particularly mentioned, but uh, for example, the sitting born is mentioned and the pilgrims are uh, presented as about to arrive there in the interlinks that they, that is in the exchanges that they actually um, um, speak together with. And this, this marks the actual place of um, the Tabard in now. About the pilgrims, in fact, the Canterbury Tales begins with an introduction on the one hand of the spring at the time of the pilgrim, and at the same time introduces the society of the 14th century. This is a general introduction to it. And uh, the narrator tells us that the pilgrims gather at the Tabard Inn, where he also is staying for a purpose of pilgrimage, and then they aim to go to Canterbury. And they come from all over England and represent almost all, uh, if you like, regions as well as the people and, and in terms of their social rank as well, the three estates of the time. And here are again a, a number of illustrations of these pilgrims. Um, and, and they seem to be in that sense a typical sort of uh, medieval pilgrim. Um, uh, before I actually set on my uh, paper, I'd like to just remind you that there are a lot of adaptations of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, some of which perhaps you are familiar with. It is made into films. Uh, it is particularly modernized for the modern view in the year 2003, I guess, if I'm not wrong. If, uh, and then 
uh, it, it, the Chaucer also is considered to be a kind of a rap uh, poet, and uh, by uh, by a student of Chaucer, by someone who actually did his uh, MA on Chaucer, uh, he was turned into rap Chaucer, and some of the tales were put into um, songs and then repeated at usually the pubs. Uh, and this uh, link actually gives you the link for the rap Chaucer. I was going to um, let you hear him, but um, I am a bit worried about the time now. Now, the Canterbury Tales, as I, as I say, is actually a, a, a work that um, introduces uh, the pilgrimage to Canterbury. That's the very main frame of this uh, story. And then it, it, uh, using this particular occasion, allows the pilgrims to tell tales. Uh, I'm not going to tell you about the initial um, plan of it, but uh, it is particularly about tale telling. It's a competition. And there are those who actually manage to get the first prize or the one who managed to, manages to get the first prize is promised a meal at the Tubbert Inn where these people are uh, staying for, um, their, before their departure for Canterbury. And um, the narrator tells us at the beginning that, as I said, the company of pilgrims staying the night at the Tower Inn come from all over England, and they are all destined for uh, Canterbury. There are altogether 29 pilgrims. This excludes the narrator and the host of the Tower Inn. And there are women pilgrims as well, as I will be telling you later on. The women uh, pilgrimage was not actually much approved. And uh, one of these women pilgrims who actually gets to tell a tale is um, a textile woman, a professional woman, in fact, a cloth maker from Bath. And one is a prioress. And the pilgrims represent, in their general frame, both the feudal structure of the time and the newly emerging moneyed groups. We have the three estates in the sense of the medieval society, for example, those who fight those that is represented by the nobility, and in our case, by the knight and his squire to some extent. Those who pray, the clergy, we have a wide spectrum of the clergy, but particularly perhaps we can mention the prioress and the monk. And then we have those who work, and this is the largest group in fact. And that seems to be the change that I identify with the Canterbury Tales taking place, particularly within this part of that society. Almost none of the pilgrims are willing to observe the boundaries of their respective estates, for example. And it seems that it is just common and uh, something usual that they are accustomed to that the estates are uh, abusing their position and seeking extra benefits or uses from the positions they hold. Particularly the commoners and particularly the five guildsmen, for example, the Franklin, the wife, the prioress, the monk, all seem to enjoy a life of pleasure and money, giving us the impression that, in fact, uh, this is actually a kind of a, a society where money is plenty, where um, food is plenty. But then, of course, we have quite a lot of references to poverty as well, especially in the sense that um, these um, people who abuse their particular position to make more money, um, more than the money that they can make actually through practicing their own profession, do prey on these poor people, their gullibility or their sometimes uh, genuine sincere feelings. And so we have uh, the sanctuary laws of the 1363 um, particularly passed in order to control the lavish spending and lavish eating that these people, although they are not entitled to, seem to be enjoying at the time. And particularly the authorities were worried that these people were making use of the clothing and dietary privileges of the, um, of the um, traditionally, of course, uh, privileged and landed aristocracy. We do see these pilgrims dressing, eating, drinking according to their new economical power and not according to their estates. And so the society represented by the pilgrims is a society of money economy and that is fast becoming an alternative to the land holding system. In this regard, we also have the Canterbury Tales as a multi vocal work. It is um, with its many pilgrims, uh, to speak about and illustrate their worldviews through the tales that they tell on their way to Canterbury 
and the links and exchanges with one another, we do see that there are a lot of views about how life should be lived, how marriages should be conducted, what love is, and uh, how the people should treat each other, especially in such relationships. Paul Citroen suggests that the Canterbury Tales presents us not with didacticism and moral certainty, which we would expect perhaps more from um, medieval work, but rather with a multitude of contending and unresolved conceptions. That is, that even Chaucer's work ostensibly seems to endorse the dominant ideology of the day. That is, that it seems to endorse, for example, the uh, feudal system, the three-partite structure of the society, and also um, what the person says here, that God ordained that uh, some fault should be more high and that some faults should be more low, and everyone should actually be content with where they are born, and therefore they should be acting and expected to act in their own degree. And that this, this kind of an order should be preserved. The parson is one of the pilgrims in the Canterbury Tales, and uh, everything that he says about such kind of relationship seems to endorse the traditional view that the the feudal society, the social structure should be maintained. Um, but we do see quite a lot of, uh, as I said, um, punctures in this particular society. Helen Phillips suggests, for example, that the Canterbury Tales, in fact, exposes the weak points. It exposes the omissions and the conflicts that are inherent within it, within that is that particular society. And in Bakhtini, in terms, Chaucer's word, work is dialogic and rather than monologic. It involves the um, dialogue of all these uh, uh, pilgrims as well as the readers and, uh, and their opinions on the, on the truths conveyed through these tales. So the, the narrator, for example, who also professes uh, uh, some sort of an inability to um, to tell the tales that uh, he is uh, presenting, uh, assumes, I'm, I'm sorry, this is not the slide in fact that I'm looking for, but I just stay here. The narrator also is um, uh, some sort of a commentator on what is going on. He seems to be a little bit gullible though. He seems to agree with all the, uh, all the pilgrims, their abuse, their corruption. And for example, he seems to um, understand the way that uh, the monk interprets his own particular vocation and uh, calls him a very good um, uh, religious leader. Then um, he seems to agree with the pardoner that um, par the pardoner is free to actually abuse people, particularly um, they trust in him and that he extracts money from um, rather poor people uh, with all the lies that he tells about religion uh, in order to actually fill his own pocket. But at the same time, there are certain statements by the narrator that um, tell us that as if we can identify him with, the, uh, with this poet Chaucer. Uh, for example, he gives some sort of an, uh, guide, guidance and direction with regard to how to tell a tale after somebody. In other words, how to, for example, relate the tales told by the pilgrims. And uh, he particularly promises a kind of faithfulness to what uh, or how the pilgrims tell their tales. That in fact, we should not um, criticize him for repeating particularly uh, rude words, uh, especially in the tales of the Miller or the Reeve or uh, some other tellers, um, because all he's doing is, is simply uh, communicating what these pilgrims tell us. Um, but um, the point that I'm trying to make is that, um, in fact, the, the society that is presented to us in this sense is a, a kind of a democratic society. The pilgrimage, in fact, gives that particular feeling, as I will be stating later on, um, that uh, everyone is somehow allowed to, to, to speak up and that we have the clash of the views, we have the clash of um, um, particular ideals, and they are all voiced. 
And I consider this as part of that change in society, allowing more freedom and more opportunities for the commoners to actually somehow establish their own identities independently of the already established system. It seems that the commoners are presented to us as uh, being able to create a world out of the, if you like, the remnants of the um, old and the somehow break, uh, breaking world of the um, traditional status quo. Uh, but at the same time, of course, as they are building their own world, uh, they, are, pre they present uh, quite a lot of um, what we can call um, breaches with regard to the uh, established and dominant ideology. Uh, for example, we do have in this kind of a democratic uh, presentation uh, a kind of a quarrel about um, who should go first in tale telling. The, the tale telling is established, uh, the order of tale telling is established by the um, host by, um, by drawing lots. And it so happens that um, so happens that it is uh, the knight who should first tell the tale according to the result of the lot drawing. But then Miller, for example, is is not very happy with this. He insists that he should be going first, and then he also insists that he should be telling a tale which doesn't seem to be suitable for his own position. Then we have, for example, the shipman who who is not very happy to listen to the uh, story told by the. Carson because it is a kind of a sermon and then he offers to tell his own tale instead. So we do see that there is on the one hand the um, established order uh, which is to be maintained at least according to Harry Bailey who is actually the sort of ordering principle of the tale telling competition but at the same time the change that is demanded by these um, um, Sort of newly emerging a group um, seem to be actually puncturing it, intruding on it, and breaking the order while it is um, somehow reintroduced and maintained also by the, um, the host. Uh, with regard to the um, major events of the um, 14th century, we can characterize the 14th century England as a very um, fortunate, eventful, but all at the same time, um, trouble period. Um, we have quite a lot of events that seem to have an impact on the kind of change that we identify as developing in the Canterbury Tales. One of these um, major events, of course, is the Black Death. And unfortunately, these days, we do have quite a lot of references to it because it was a, a great uh, pandemic which killed, uh, according to some sources, one third of the population in Britain and some suggest that it was as high as half, that is about 50% of the population. And uh, the consequences of this particular uh, Black Death, um, then we have the peasants revolt of the, the, towards the end of the 14th century in 1381, and we have a particular anti-clerical movement known as Lollardy. Now Chaucer makes um, very few references to these. Uh, we can count them as very passing references, but we do at the same time um, have the particular impact as recognized by the work itself. Uh, Colin Platt, who is actually a, a scholar in this particular field, states that for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, in fact, um, echoing the sort of marriage vows in a way, okay, uh, that English society changed at the Black Death. And according to some, Black Death wiped out the good things of the civilization, especially if you associate it with the, uh, again, the feudal system and the structure, the established system, and the entire world changed. The references to the Black Death in the Canterbury Tales uh, show it as deadly and frightening, but also we do see that it, is, uh, it was profitable for some. For example, the doctor of physic, the physician in the Canterbury Tales seems to have made a lot of profit from the plague, for instance, and it is actually in this particular context that the plague is mentioned. Uh, he seems to have abused people's frustration, helplessness, uh, because obviously as a doctor, he would know that the, unfortunately the disease was not treatable. At the time, 
people were not very knowledgeable about it. They did know that it was actually contagious and the disease was easily spreading if people got together and then they stayed in confined places. So quite a lot of the people who would be, who were able to afford it would leave the cities and go to uh, the, the countryside and take refuge there. Um, <clears throat> but apart from that, they didn't have a particular cure for it. And the, the pandemic seems to have worked its unfortunate toll on the people, killed a lot of people, for regardless of their particular estate, regardless of their gender, um, and then it disappeared. But then it came back. So it actually is very, um, continued in waves or in frequent strikes. Um, then we have a reference to it in the Pardon's tale. Um, which says that, particularly speaking about that, that that actually is closely associated with the plague, is almost synonymous with it, and is said to have slain a thousand this pestilence. That is, that actually this pestilence or the plague killed about a thousand. This one, again, suggesting that in fact it came in waves. And then we have, uh, again, another reference to that. In this country, all the people were slain. That is, all the people were killed. And this was the case, unfortunately, for most of the time, for some manners, for some particular lands, uh, which were left altogether um, ownerless. Landlords were, were killed by the plague. And then the lands were left untilled or uncultivated. And this uh, led to uh, the kind of decrease in the boat, in the ownership of the land, and also uh, the workforce. Canterbury Tales also recognizes lollardy and anti-clerical movement of the time, uh, which perhaps can be related back to the uh, Black Death as well, and then forward to the Peasants' Revolt, which follows after. Um, there is only one, it seems, reference to it when the parson, the most uh, sort of traditional and the quote unquote ideal uh, pilgrim of the Canterbury Tales warns the uh, host, Harry Bailey, about swearing and tells him not to, not to swear. And then Harry, Harry Bailey answers, uh, oh, Jenkins, referring to a kind of a diminutive word for John, John Wycliffe, who was the leader of this uh, Wycliffeite or the Lollard movement. And he says, oh, I smell a Lollard in the wind. In fact, of course, he says this in joking, but um, it was a very serious business at the time. Those who were associated or identified as lawyers would be burnt at the stake. They, would be, they were considered to be heretics, especially by the Londoners, and they were hated. But it says there's an interesting thing about this because uh, John of Gaunt, who was the patron of Chaucer, was also associated, well, was believed to be associated with the Lollard movement. And in fact, he narrowly escaped lynching when the peasants, um, the peasants' revolt broke out and the peasants marched towards London. And also uh, this Harry Bailey and sometimes Chaucer seems to be associated with Lollardy, particularly because of their views about this changing society and what should be actually taken as, um, uh, as sort of more important compared to what the particular the clergy was practicing at the time. And so um, <clears throat> all this uh, on the one hand that uh, we have in the depiction of the pilgrims and on the other hand going on in society uh, and creating a, a society or a culture or a world of change being recognized by the, by the work itself. Uh, it seems to have also certain sort of um, at least um, underlying it, the peasants' revolt, which, as I said, is actually an important event of the time. It is believed to have challenged and threatened the feudal system when it actually first broke out and seemed to have also far-reaching consequences for that. Uh, as Lollardy is considered to be the sort of uh, uh, earlier kind of reformation, something that actually heralded the um, later reformation, um, the peasants' revolt also has been considered to be actually a, an important event that gave rise to this uh, entire collapse of the feudal system eventually and replacement of it with uh, money or the capital 
a capitalistic system. Okay. The peasant's revolt um, here is um, famous particularly for some what we can call very unconventional and revolutionary ideas. Its leader, Walt Tyler, unfortunately was killed. Um, some say by mistake, but in fact, they actually wanted to subdue the um, revolt and that's why. And John Ball um, seems to have developed this particular idea. They, this, is a, they, this is their chant. Uh, they, they say, when Adam dealt and Eve span, who was then a gentleman? They are, as you do see, there is a very direct challenge to the feudal system and this kind of landlord, um, landlords, the authorities having power over the, um, uh, over the peasants. Uh, and this, this is also developed, okay. And arguing that we are all equal and that we should all share equally in whatever the country has to offer to us. Here are a few uh, sort of uh, illustrations of that particular uprising. It was unfortunately a very uh, violent one and it was a bloody one. And it actually, the, the peasants, they were not actually peasants, they were the new um, money holders, so to speak. And uh, they wanted to um, have better share and more money in, in the general, what you can call perhaps national income. And they uh, were against the, for example, the, uh, the control of the rising wages after the Black Death and the certain, certain statutes that were passed in order to contain the demand for higher wages. Um, well, in fact, th this didn't work, okay, neither the laws worked, although they stayed in power for a long time, nor uh, the pressure on these peasants, or nor the, in fact, the um, very fact that this, this revolt, as violent it was, was equally violently subdued. John Ball, the leader of the peasants' revolt, says this, for example, uh, Things cannot go on like this, he says, okay, cannot go right in England and never will until goods are held in common and there are no more villains and gentlefolk, but we are all one and the same. But of course, these views were contested and um, there was a lot of criticism on these demands as well as uh, the idea that in fact, England can become a, a country of equal people. And uh, so the criticism would come that the pride of the lower order, referring to the commoners, has so blossomed forth and grown these days in fine dress and splendid display in the variety of fashions that one can hardly um, distinguish one person from one another. This actually is a reference to the breakdown of the borders between these estates because of their gorgeous clothes and accessories. Each imitates the other and strives to introduce some new fashion and to excel his period by wearing even grander clothes. Now these demands that they should actually have um, um, <clears throat> equal rights and they should be treated equally uh, are met by then the child king about 14 years old he was, Richard II. And he is famously put this or infamously put this, these words. Rustics you were, and rustics you are still. That is, you were peasants, and then you're still peasants. You will remain in bondage. That is, this um, feudal system will stay intact, not as before, but incomparably harsher. And uh, um, it is stated of, again, Richard II, that he actually took back some of the uh, privileges that he earlier granted to these people, and hence, uh, made their bondage a bit harsher as well. <clears throat> now, th this idea of change, the kind of change that we observe in the Canterbury Tales is, I think, is uh, in fact inscribed in the work um, by, by particularly um, the, um, the frame that it uses, the narrative device, uh, uh, the pilgrimage. The pilgrimage itself is not only a narrative device, but it is also an indicator of the change that characterizes the medieval world represented in the work. Pilgrimage enables the traditionally incongruous and separate groups to come together and share equally the same experience of spiritual quest. I actually say this with hesitation, but it creates a kind of a democratic world of equal representation as opposed to the feudal hierarchical system. 
The pilgrimage to Canterbury is significant, therefore, in this sense too. Pilgrimage was very common in the Middle Ages. And even Demi suggests that for many medieval Christians, going on pilgrimage was not so much like lounging on a journey. That is, it wasn't actually something uh, much of a big deal. It was as of going to a local market town to sell or buy geese or chickens. And the shrines that they visited would function as a local rather than a liminal phenomenon, that it was very much a part of the life. Chaucer is believed to have observed these um, pilgrimages and the pilgrims uh, from his uh, particular position in London, where he worked and also he uh, stayed, uh, and then uh, seems to have drawn on these actual pilgrims and pilgrimages, although, of course, the pilgrimage that he presents to us is entirely fictional. But still, it gives very much a very, or a very strong sense of reality. Pilgrimage was considered to be a kind of a metaphor for human life as well, and that in that sense, it was encouraged by the, by the church, especially because its aim was spiritual perfection, uh, and the spiritual perfection it was believed was not to be found in this uh, in life here. So there was a, accordingly a great control over the pilgrimage. There was a great uh, sort of attempt to regulate it. It was subject to, for example, permission of the authorities or the spurious um, to, to join these pilgrimages. It's represented, on the other hand, therefore, a kind of liberation from the constraints of the, of the social restrictions. And um, it, it, it was for the pilgrims who actually managed to take part in it, a kind of um, free entertainment as well. Because of this, it was criticized heavily as well. And that uh, pilgrims, because the church especially did not believe in the sincerity of the motives of these pilgrims, um, and uh, that did not want them to go on pilgrimages, particularly of the pilgrimage uh, in terms of the places, like for example, Canterbury. Uh, but again, they did not much of a uh, power on that. And the people continued to do these uh, pilgrimages and they were very uh, popular in fact. Because a pilgrimage uh, both um, symbolically and literally was associated with traveling. And uh, the pilgrims of the time would consider pilgrimages as a kind of a, a holiday making. And or, or especially in the case of, for example, the wife of Bath, um, it would be actually an opportunity to, be, to see people and also to be seen by these people. And the, the pilgrims in the Canterbury pilgrims are a bit frank about their motives, in fact. There. Um, Canterbury Tales also, as I said, represents a particular consciousness with its sexuality. Uh, it, it presents it as a work that is a, a written work. At the same time, it is represented as an oral work. As the retraction at the very end of it uh, suggests, in fact, we have many references to its um, being a product, a, a work of an individual writer, and that uh, we have also quite a lot of references to the written works uh, of the time, uh, of the authors, for example. In fact, most of the tales seem to be also situated in a written tradition. Uh, Canterbury Tales itself is, uh, um, appears to be very popular and uh, is uh, um, produced in several manuscripts. We seem to have more than 80 manuscripts to show its popularity. But um, uh, this I use as a kind of a testimony to its existence and also presentation of a literate culture as well as a written culture. Uh, the work makes, as I said, references to its printedness for instance, particularly when the narrator gets very self-conscious about repeating the stories of, of the pilgrims, and um, then, especially the miller, for example, and then, then he actually directs the reader to other tales and uh, suggests that uh, the reader can turn over the leaf and choose another tale. 
and that this is actually a, a kind of an, a game democratic uh, world where you can choose from the printed or the written tales, the one that is most true to your own taste and liking. And uh, he also um, in, in this regard gives uh, a, a kind of description of the Canterbury Tales itself says that we have here quite a lot of uh, stories, uh, tales, uh, great and small, and uh, some of them are about gentleness or are the, of the gentle matter. Some of them are about morality and holiness, but some of them are obviously um, um, not so moral tales, obscene tales, bold tales, but uh, you're free to choose your own. And in this regard, we have an image of the reader holding the book of the Canterbury Tales and skipping through the pages. Chaucer himself is, as I said, portrayed reading his own work to a group of listeners. Um, the, another perhaps reference to uh, the existence of a written culture would be uh, in the case of the wife of Bath, who complains in her uh, prologue that her her husband, her fifth husband, who is a clerk, reads to her from a book of, she names this, book of wicked wives, to tame her and to correct her behavior. The wife does not seem to have much of an education in this sense, but all the education, all the knowledge that she has of these stories seems to come from uh, this uh, sort of listening to such stories, especially the stories of the misogynist literature and tradition. But her clerk husband uh, seems to be very well learned and uh, a literate person who actually seems to have this book, a kind of a perhaps a manuscript collection of stories of women doing um, MS with regard to their relationship with their husbands. And there is also the evidence that um, the pilgrims who are represented in the Canterbury Tales more or less are literate, although literacy uh, is not the same as we understand it today, that in fact literacy could be part literacy. For example, people would be able to read but not able to write. This is usually the case for women, or uh, that uh, they would use um, as much as they could read and write in order to um, do their own jobs. For example, uh, the guildsman, the man of law, the knight, squire, Franklin, the shipman, etc., all do jobs that require them to actually be able to read and write. So in that sense, we do have an acknowledgement of the, um, again, written culture there too. Um, I am a bit watchful of the time and the time, uh, how much time do I have? It's, I seem to have overrun my time a little bit. You have five more minutes. minutes. Pardon? Five more minutes. Okay, so I will use it to just focus on the wife of Bath and the world that she represents, particularly for the women of the Middle Ages. She is uh, usually interpreted as uh, anti-feminism incarnate because all she does, in, uh, as she tells us in her prologue, is uh, to actually do the opposite of what uh, the women are expected to do. She is a lying, cheating, uh, sexually, um, forward uh, woman, but at the same time, she seems to be um, very uh, aware of the existing social order that actually subjects her in, the, in a way to uh, the kind of life that she and all the wives in the Middle Ages were subjected to. She does, um, in fact, comments on um, particularly um, the authority and she says this with regard to the authority. Let me see. Experience, she says, okay, is actually the authority. And there's a direct challenge to that because she seems to have suffered like the other women of the Middle Ages from the authority of, the, of these clerks of the written culture particularly. And so she says that experience, no written authority I will um, recognize and the experience is the good enough authority for me and experience is enough uh, authority for me to speak of the pain or the woe that is in marriage. And she says that this is because since she was 12 years of age, she was um, in marriage and she, she's been in marriage and that she actually married five times and uh, I had to have five husbands, she says, at the church door and that's how I should know through my experience, 
that in fact marry, what marriage is. This is a direct challenge, of course, to the authority of these uh, church fathers, the priests, uh, Christianity in general, uh, of, and what they say of marriage. The other thing that I'd like to actually mention about um, the wife of Bath and her challenge uh, uh, to the authorities and the established system and her demand for change is that she, um, speaking of the wicked, the book of wicked wives of her fifth husband, she says, well, all these stories are written by men and the reason why we don't have similar stories about men who will tell the wickedness of men is because women have no authority to write stories. They don't have any means actually to write stories. And I take this as actually as a direct challenge to the established discourse, knowledge of the time and the wife's own way of producing or trying to produce her own knowledge. Uh, she says, who painted the line with reference to a particular Azop's fable that where we have a lion and then man discussing who is stronger. And then they come across the sculpture which shows the lion being beaten by a man. And then uh, the man shows the sculpture and says, um, hey, look, you see, uh, it, man is stronger than the lion. And the lion replies, hey, tell me who painted the lion. And uh, so this kind of production of knowledge is questioned by the wife. And she says that, um, who painted the lion? Tell me who. If women had written stories as clerks have written within their studies, they would have written men of more wickedness than all the mark of Adam made their dress. That is, it wouldn't have been possible for Adam to actually clean, so to speak, or redress that particular wrong, she says. And thus she, in fact, uh, uh, produces a challenge, a further challenge to uh, the established system that unfortunately subordinates uh, women and put them into um, subordinate position. And I take this as a kind of a power struggle that characterizes the rest of the Canterbury Tales with a whiz, what actually goes on in the world that Chaucer tries this way or other represent in the Canterbury Tales. Thank you very much. I'm sorry that I have actually overstepped a little bit my time. Thank you very much, Professor Reyes, for this inspiring, challenging, and thought-provoking talk. Thank you very much indeed. We have time for questions or comments, but before that, I'd like to recommend a beautiful film version of the Canterbury Tales. Oh, this is an Italian film. The director is Pier Paolo Pasolini, oh. and I racconti the Canterbury or the Canterbury Tales. Uh, it was shot in 1972. It's an art film and it works well uh, in the classroom. Oh, okay. Great, it's a beautiful film. Thank you. Okay. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, question marks, uh, comments, please, uh, the floor is yours. Um, you can also, uh, Professor Reis, you can also read the questions on the chat box. Okay, here it is. Okay, I'm sorry for that because I'm at a friend's house. What I'm going to ask is, of course, very speculative here because can we choose his choice of not completing the pilgrimage as a subtle statement of change that you have identified in favor of a more secular worldview instead of a religious one? Oh, yes, thank you, Ulash. That's actually a very interesting thing. And then I think something that scholars have been uh, discussing. Um, we don't have the exact reason why Chaucer actually left it unfinished. One speculation is that he left it unfinished because uh, um, because he died, unfortunately, okay, um, because this work that he, he uh, started writing in, or composing or compiling, uh, he started in the 1380s, uh, some suggest as late as 1387, and then continued until his death in the 14th. But I think, then I, I would agree with you that, in fact, there is a very strong reason there that, in fact, he did not finish it. Uh, deliberately, because the pilgrims do not actually reach Canterbury, in fact. Uh, 
and then they do not do or perform whatever um, task they were set to perform. And in that sense, perhaps, yes, that he actually leaves it unfinished deliberately in order to suggest that it's high time for this change. Um, the, the, remembering that he was actually accused of Lollardy and uh, uh, not in his own time, but uh, later on by some suggested that perhaps these views would have identified him with Lollardy, also supports this view, okay, that he was actually well aware of what was going on in, in his own world and uh, he did not want to um, endorse it by actually sort of making this uh, pilgrimage somehow successful? This was a very good question, by the way. Absolutely. Yes, thank you very much, yes. Uh -huh. Ah, hocam, Deniz hocam. Deniz hocam. Thank you, hocam. Oh, I forgot to unmute myself. Thank you, Hodi Hoja. That was a wonderful talk. I really did enjoy revisiting the Canterbury Tales after a long you, time. Um, I was just thinking about the development of the short story as a genre. Uh, we all know that uh, Chaucer's contemporary Boccaccio in Italy, with his uh, prose work, telling tales in prose. <laughs> Um, actually paved the way to the short, uh, short story as a modern genre. But uh, could we consider Chaucer? Uh, can we say that he has made any contribution to the development of telling tales or uh, to the short story? Maybe not as a modern genre, but to the yeah. short story mm -hmm. in uh, England. It is actually very interesting, which I mean, that connection. In the first place, um, the, we don't have much evidence that Chaucer knew Decameron or knew, so for that matter, for Boc uh, Boccaccio, although some suggest that he must have mm. somehow met him. But uh, it is highly likely that he must have heard of Decameron and that uh, this Canterbury Tales is a kind of a development on Decameron because uh, we have. Uh, in, in terms of the tellers, for example, tellers coming from all different uh, strata of society. Um, but in, in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, yes, most of them are um, uh, worse uh, stories, but at the same time, we do have one or two um, prose uh, tales as well. And um, Chaucer seems to be, if that will help at all, Chaucer seems to be very conscious of telling a tale. And then we have a, a number of comments coming from the tellers sometimes um, about how well, for example, a certain author tells a tale and then how it is very important that the tale's conclusion is well developed or that how, for example, the very starting point for the um, Canterbury Tales, um, how the tale should uh, or the story should entertain, but at the same time educate and provide a moral. In fact, in that sense, perhaps we can think of uh, this as a kind of a contribution towards tale telling. Tale telling seems to be very common in the Middle Ages, um, and the reading these tales uh, for educational purpose, educational purposes seem to be also very common. And we have this evidence of, for example, the wife of Bath's. Um, husband who actually seemed to have this huge book of, of, of wicked wives and their stories. And perhaps in that sense, we can consider Chaucer as well. And some actually do, do refer to the Canterbury Tales as, as a kind of a um, collection of short stories as well. Thank you very much, Udiyoja. Thank you. Uh, right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Islam. I have classmates here, Hocam. Not only Gülşen, but also, uh, also Islam. Thank you. As far thank as you very there. much, Islam. Thank you. I'm proud, I'm proud of my friends for the uh, this right. presentation. Thank you so much. I'm so much uh, enlightened and added uh, so much to my uh, uh, knowledge. Thank you so much for inviting me, Gülşen. So it feels and like I'm in the classroom. Thank you. Thank you. I'm honored. Thank you for being Thank with you. us, Aslam. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Um, I thank you. I would also like to remind, uh, thank you all for coming and remind uh, you that, in fact, there's a very good translation of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales uh, uh, into Turkish. 
and that is um, Al's translation, yes. As far as I know, Burchin Hoca also translated the general prologue, but Nazmi Al's translation is um, the sort of ent entire collection uh, of tales. And we use uh, his translation uh, as well as Burchin Hoca's uh, sort of uh, prologue in, in, in turning uh, the Canterbury Tales into a play, gosh, so not so long ago. <laughs> uh, and, and played it as our uh, annual um, department play, Canterbury Tales, yes, in Turkish. It was fun too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Jam, can I also ask a question if there are no other questions? Of course, of course. Good uh, it's such a great pleasure to have you uh, as our speaker today at Atlas University. Uh, and I am very grateful for this wonderful talk, actually. And I'm also quite happy that this event is taking place just a week before we are going to start discussing Chaucer in class. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we are going to talk about uh, the Book of the Duchess. Uh, I mean, after we talk about uh, the general prologue to the Canterbury Tales. So it's a great opportunity for my students to develop an insight into okay. Chaucer's poetry yeah. too. Um, so thank you very much for this talk. And I was just wondering about your thoughts on the narrators um, in the general prologue to the Canterbury Tales or the Book of the Duchess. Uh, I mean, you have already described them as gullible characters. Perhaps if you want, you can elaborate on this a little. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I mean, that's, uh, this, this is actually yet another area of interest, especially in identifying whose views are presented to us, because there seems to be a kind of constant shift between Chaucer the narrator and Chaucer the poet at, at some points in, in both the general prologue and also in the, in the book of the Duchess. But basically, yes, this is, of course, a kind of a position that the that Chaucer uh, adopts through his narrator. The narrator um, is presented as gullible. He actually uh, says this in the Canterbury Tales as well as in the Book of the Duchess. In fact, throughout all the works that where we have the presence of the narrator, that uh, he is slow, that he doesn't have much of a bit that he doesn't understand and he has no skill whatsoever in actually, uh, for example, telling the tales. In the Canterbury Tales, uh, you will probably find out, or you do know, he is actually included as one of the pilgrims. His name is Jeffrey, and he tells the worst ever tale to the extent that the, the, the host cannot bear with this uh, tale telling and stops him and says, for God's sake, I mean, save us uh, this, uh, this nonsense and asks him to actually do something else. And uh, he also appears to be someone who is a bit different from uh, what the general prologue in the opening introduces him to be. He, he there is very sociable. He tells us that he talked to every one of these pilgrims one by one and found out about them all. And so it appears to be actually sort of someone who takes initiative and approaches people and tells uh, his opinion he does not share with them, but um, but in the pilgrimage, he appears to be someone who actually is very quiet and very introvert, withdrawn. And again, he's somehow bullied by the host for this too. The idea, of course, is that it, the narrator is not identifiable with Chaucer, but is a, a, a deliberately uh, produced uh, extra character uh, to, to keep a kind of an ironic distance from what actually uh, represents. But I personally believe that especially um, and as many scholars seem to agree with this, that in the dream poems, when the narrator is presented as a book form, okay, when he refuses to, to learn through experience, when he states that I do not know love indeed, and that uh, I am very happy and satisfied with what I know from the books. And when he's forced by his, what I call dream authorities to actually take part in real life. And there is a sort of ironic replacement of the real life through dreams with the books uh, in, in the dream poems particularly. I think that that bit of um, the narrator as a bookish um, um, narrator who's actually 
particularly into reading books, who owns books, in fact. Uh, about 60 of them, according to the uh, prologue to the legend of Good Woman, uh, that in that sense, there is a connection between him and, and Chaucer. I think we are a little bit confused about it too. As I said, I mean, there are certain things that you, you can identify with Chaucer, but quite a lot uh, with the narrator, because the narrator who professes to be short-witted, a bit uh, gullible and not very clever, also is able to relate all these stories to us, for example, okay? So, I mean, is, is able to actually, if, if not uh, practice, to repeat all these uh, real good stories to us. So it is a little bit of a game, I think, that Chaucer is playing with his readers. I mean, it's very modern. Question. I think in this sense, it's very modern. It's definitely even postmodern. Yes. Incredibly modern, yes, postmodern, definitely. There is a strong awareness of the tale telling in the first place, mm -hmm. and that there is what I can call a meta narrative that continues throughout both the dream poems and the uh, Canterbury Tales. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Ojal. <laughs> I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you so much. There seems to be one more question here. Yes, Adriana. Hey, Adriana. Oh, hello, Adriana. Um, uh, thank you very much. That was a very, very enlightening uh, talk. Um, I, I read Chaucer as a student. I never had the privilege to teach him. So uh, it's high time that, that I should uh, revisit him. Of course, I, I revisit him occasionally. Um, I'm going to ask, my question will be of a more uh, methodological nature, let's say. I was wondering, um, in the world of, of scholars uh, uh, working on, on, on Chaucer, how, how very comfortable um, are you, let's say, with li this more um, uh, contemporary literary theories perspectives? For example, to a student, to a graduate student who would like to work on Chaucer in, in this time and, and age, um, how, how uh, I mean, would they be accused of a, of a presentism? You were talking, you were mentioning at the very beginning of your talk, you were mentioning Chaucer's multivocal world. You were mentioning yes. that thing. So I suspect a lot has been done in that field uh, already. I was also thinking, it, it came to my mind that he's actually very, I don't know, uh, very um, Aristotelian in the sense of, of becoming as opposed to Plato in the sense of being. I was thinking, Everything in his world is is is is fluent, is is flowing, is in continuous transformation. The very theoretical yes. frame of the pilgrimage, the, the the voyage, the transformation, everything speaks about that. But strictly methodologically speaking, what you would advise, or what is there to be done for somebody who loves Chaucer, wants to work on Chaucer, uh, but is afraid to to project our contemporary perspective onto an author who lived centuries ago. Would that be okay? Yes, thank you very much for that question. In fact, at one of the conferences, I think it was a Congress organized by New Chaucer Society. Um, that there was actually a particular session about this, whether we should actually read Chaucer um, as, um, from the perspective of our, as you said, contemporary understanding of the Middle Ages, whether, for example, particularly, they seem to be, to my liking, to have far too conservative uh, about this, but uh, whether we could use the modern uh, contemporary theories, for example, to read and understand Chaucer, and are we, as you said, projecting our own views on Chaucer and or a medieval text. So th there was actually two camps, in fact, and some people did argue that no, it's not uh, all right to actually read a medieval poet from the lenses of our time. My view on this is that, yes, we can. Why? Because in fact, even if we recognize the authority, the difference of the Middle Ages, and that we recognize that it's a different world with its own customs, and I have just presented on the Chaucer's world that I try to understand through uh, his work, we still are um, 21st century people. And uh, our view of the Middle Ages is inevitably mediated. And this mediation, whether you try to do it through the understandings of what we consider to be medieval or contemporary, is after all 
our own frame that we actually, or the lens that we actually use to understand the Middle Ages or the, or the work of Chaucer. I think it is inevitable that, for example, I respond to the wife of Bath, for instance, from my own uh, cultural and the historical perspective. On the one hand, I do recognize, for example, that some suggest Chaucer wouldn't have, couldn't have written differently. Right? Because there is quite a lot of pressure there. And he actually also makes a point of this pressure on him in, in his prologue to the legend of good woman after presenting Chris Hader, for example, as very unfaithful, doing wrong to Troilus, uh, etc. Although he insists that he does it as a result of simply copying and then sort of translating the words. But still, um, I mean, even if we try to look at it from that particular perspective, our understanding of the wife of Bath, for example, uh, whether we sort of endorse or approve of her behavior or whether we think of her as a victim or a victimizer still has to be colored, I think, by our, our own culture. So I hope this is an answer to your question. Yeah. I do use uh, contemporary theory and uh, such frames to understand and read Chaucer, in fact. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Diana, thank you. Yes, indeed. Um, ah, Aidan is here too. Thank you, Aidan. Yes. OK. Is Aidan asking a question? It seems that she has no questions. No, no, I don't have any questions. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Aidan, for your uh, participation. OK. You. Uh, Adriana, can I ask what you think of it? Uh, I'm sorry. If, if the, same, the same way you do. Um, okay. uh, I, was, um, I, I have started, I mean, um, I, I cannot consider myself a, a Shakespearean. But I have been working and writing on Shakespeare, and it's the same question that I'm. Uh, I'm. I have to answer at times when my own students, when when graduate students are interested, uh, what what are they supposed to? Do? And I said, well, as long as you are able to, I don't know, uh, contextualize. Yeah, be be very much aware of the of the historical, political, cultural context of the time. It is inevitable. Yeah, you need to, uh, but then. Uh, ideally, you should be able to establish some some kind of um, connections somehow. For example, I don't know. I was reading this Catherine Bounce's uh, on, uh, on on on Shakespeare, and she was yeah. uh, on, on rape of. Uh, I think it was on on the rape of Lucrece, mm -hmm. and she does use Lacan there. It's a it's mm -hmm. a very well uh, written uh, article, but somehow she makes the connection with what I would call proto psychoanalytical thought <laughs> um, the emphasis on, on sexuality at the at the time when when Shakespeare produced that so of course ideally I think that the two our contemporary perspective with perhaps some not perfect counterparts but some connections with that particular area that would that would give us the, a whole uh, perspective but of course I don't think we can yes. we cannot use our um, our frame of mind and theories who have influenced us. So I, I do completely agree with your perspective in that. It changes uh, quite a lot, again, the, the way that we look at the text, uh, for example. Um, and there is a huge debate, again, going on, or was, in fact, with regard to the wife of Pat, for example. I mean, how, how we should actually read her, whether we should read her from this anti-feminist, misogynist tradition of the time, which condemns, obviously, and therefore condemns the wife, and then, therefore, should we actually see the wife as uh, someone who is actually presented as a kind of exemplum to the rest of the people, to the world. Or that now from looking from this particular perspective, I mean, she is after all uh, somebody, a girl, a young girl who's married at uh, 12, and then she was literally both, and then she was uh, sort of handed over to another rich man and then to another rich man. And then what she does seems to be somehow taking um, or making the best of that particular situation, uh, it seems. Okay, she's the victimizer, yes, to some extent, especially in terms of the old age of the husbands, but she's also a victim. And, uh, and uh, she seems to be a part of this marriage economy that actually was at the time licensed and sanctioned by the church and by the general culture as well. So um, 
I think uh, in that sense, uh, this actually provides an entirely different perspective. Absolutely, a survivor. <laughs> yeah, and there is actually a resistance to that, though. I mean, to to reading uh, Chaucer or medieval literature through, uh, as you put it, from the perspective of the twenty first century. But I don't think that this is actually something that can be avoided. I mean, I cannot see the medieval world through the lenses of the medieval world. That's not possible either, unless we do time traveling. Um, but still, even as time traveling, I mean, you, you would be witnessing an entirely different world. There is a particular article about it, about the authority of the, the changes or difference of the Middle Ages. I think it's about more or less the same thing. Mm -hmm. And gradually we're arriving there. Though. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Adriana. It was a very enlightening question. Thank you. For it was the question of a graduate student and of somebody who was a student who read Chaucer a long time ago. Like I said, I do revisit him every now and then, but it, uh, you know, I, I have never taught uh, Chaucer. I remember thoroughly enjoying the, the tales. Uh, it, it's going to be on my to-do, on my to-read list this soon. But um, you know, we are we are. Uh, uh, oh yes, yes, always. We are instructors here. We are we are expected to supervise thesis. MA thesis, PhD thesis, and this, these questions always uh, consume us in a yes. way, or at least I find that's the case yes. with me. Yes. So thank you very much. Uh, I think Chulash was in the audience and he's uh, working together, he's about to finish. If Ulash, are you still here? Um, about, for example, monstrosity and the monsters in the Middle Ages, but he's using a, quite a contemporary literary theory, a cultural theory, monster studies, for example, oh, monster sure. studies, in order to actually understand there. And then the, he seems to be actually turning upside down quite a lot of the verities or the, uh, what we can call sort of uh, traditional acceptances of the Middle Ages um, in order to actually illustrate his point in terms of the monstrous or the monstrosity. So yes, it is inevitable, I think. And Chaucer actually sanctions this because he's a reader himself, he's a reader writer, and he encourages the reader to actually read in their own way. He does tell us that, you know, you, you construe it as you like. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm afraid I have to close the session. Thank you, Furiye Hocam. Thank you for uh, being with us. I'd like to thank everybody who is here. Thank you very much uh, for sharing this evening with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm hoping to see you in our next uh, webinar. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much again to Atlas University, to Professor Gülşen Sayın, to all the colleagues there, and to all the participants who actually made time for this talk today. See you hopefully face to face next time uh, in the future. Thank you, Hurya Hoca. Thank you very much. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.